We have an interesting subject this morning that we all more or less accept and think about, but very often we don't do very much of anything about it. Is it a little too far from the machine? Well, I'm still fighting a cold, so I'll have to move up a little on the machine. Is that going to be better? Okay. The body, in its relation to the person that lives in it, is very much like a house, the old family homestead. And we forget very often that the person and the house represent two completely separate principles, uh, two parts of a compound. And the relationship between the body and the person living in it is one of the most important in all of the study of humanity. The house is something that is built and composed not of inert material, but of living substance. The body is not stone. It is self-renewing, self-generating, self-restoring in many ways and parts, and at the same time, it is something we have to protect and guard. The relationship begins when we realize that the person is an individual entity and that its entrance into the material world through the body is entering a house. The person exists prior to the body. The person survives the body. The person continues down through the ages, according to at least some philosophical systems, to create new bodies and to build into each body the experiences of previous building, so that theoretically each body that we build should bear witness to the degree of internal integration we have achieved. The body uh, is very much like the house in another particular, and that is it requires upkeep. We have a tendency uh, to assume that the body takes care of itself. And we do the same thing with it that we often do with a fine home. We neglect it. If we have a nice house and we do not manage it well, it will gradually deteriorate. If we do not combine our bodily function with a plan of management, the body gradually loses its vitality. Everyone knows about the house they have entered at some time during their lifetime, a house of a friend. The yard is beautifully kept up, the house is well painted, but inside of the house there is neglect. This neglect uh, seemingly is due to the fact that the person feels that if the outside looks right, if they keep it well painted and the garden well weeded, the neighbors will think well of them. And very few people are going to see the neglect inside of the house. This is true also in the body situation. Very often we spend considerable time, effort, money, in maintaining the outward appearance of a body. But we neglect its inner needs. We are much more aware of taking care of the cosmetic aspects of the body than we are of maintaining its internal health. The attitude seems to be that if we protect the surface, the rest takes care of itself. This is not true. We also find that it is sometimes convenient to bring in cleaning agencies or carpenters or builders to repair and restore damage inside of a house, such as neglected plumbing or wiring. 
We do the same thing with the body. We bring in experts on various fields when the body gives us serious difficulties. We use the physician, the physiotherapist, the dietitian to take care of troubles appearing within the body itself. But for the most part, we drift along assuming that the body will stand a tremendous amount of punishment, and because of this assumption, we continue to punish it every day. Now, it is much better as we think along to realize that this commonwealth of the flesh, which is our temporary home, is part of our karmic and cosmic responsibilities. The individual who believes that he has to grow and unfold his religious and psychological potentials must also take responsibilities for the things that are his in this world. Many people go out trying to be spiritual. They neglect their families. They neglect their homes. Very often they assume that the larger dedication liberates them from the daily responsibilities of maintenance. This is not true. There is no more important aspect of religion than the individual taking care of those things that have been entrusted to him, or over which he has taken a voluntary management. So in the case of the body, it is not only important to realize that there are spiritual centers in the body, there are meditative factors that can be stimulated, there are extrasensory perceptions and all these things. But in this quest of these higher values, we must be very careful not to overlook the need of the plumbing and the wiring and the daily house cleaning. The moment we begin to neglect the body, it begins to react adversely. And it is our problem and our proper duty to keep the harmony between the body and the mind in every possible way. The mind in its own turn is very largely supported by an instrument which we call the brain. The brain is physical. The brain is something that depends for its function upon the maintenance of the physical body. The moment the physical body is damaged, the possibility of interference with mental and emotional processes uh, increases. We have to maintain the body in order to use the mind. Now, in the course of years, I've come across a great many people who have allowed a deterioration of their physical living to impair their minds. They are persons of fair capacities. They are persons who could have done something with their lives, but due to more or less neglect or complete indifference to the basic problems of mind-body relationships, they have found themselves in a dangerous situation, and what should have been a wonderful partnership ended in ruin. We have to recognize, for example, the common failing of our day, alcoholism. The effect of alcoholism on the body is obvious, and nothing can affect the body like alcoholism that does not also affect the mind. It affects the entire life. It interferes with every objective and purpose of human existence. And unless this is controlled, the individual is in serious trouble. There are many other f habits which have to be variously regenerated, redeemed, and reorganized in order to maintain the bodily health. So we might say, for generally speaking at least, that the body is a kind of a pedestal on which stands the person. Everything we want to do on the higher levels of life depends of uh, upon certain biological, biochemical adjustments. Where the body is uncomfortable, the person is unhappy. Where bodily conditions are irritated, the temperament is irritated. 
and where the body is allowed to become discouraged, the person in the body suffers discouragement. Most of the mental and emotional attitudes that we have arise from physical inconveniences of one kind or another. These inconveniences may some of them be deliberate callousness, others may be the result of circumstances comparatively beyond our control. But the basic truth remains that the body is very important and that the individual who sacrifices his health must have a very great and important thing to do to justify this sacrifice. Because if he does sacrifice it, regardless of his motives or intentions, the bodily harmony will be interfered with. Now we know in most cases that we have disciplines for the development of the mind and the control of the emotions. These disciplines mean a great deal to the average individual, particularly now. And there are hundreds of schools springing up, large and small, old and new, relating to disciplines of enlightenment. Disciplines intended to expand the consciousness of the person, to enlarge and ennoble character, and even to develop extrasensory perceptions and psychic faculties. Nearly all of these processes that are worth the name require very strong and stern self-discipline. Anything that is promised without effort is worth about what the lack of effort is worth. There is no way of winning any extension of ability without dedication of purpose. So the person begins various disciplines he practices yoga or Zen, he meditates and contemplates and re performs retrospective disciplines, and to a certain measure he tries to keep the body in reasonable condition. But the moment he starts to meditate or use any of these higher faculties, he is likely to come into conflict with the body. Now the reason why this happens is that in a great many people the body has been spoiled. It is a spoiled child and like such a child is very difficult to manage and resents any interference with the habit mechanisms which it has built up. These habit mechanisms of the body are apt to be negative like the habit mechanisms of the mind and emotions. But the person attempting to settle down quietly to the cultivation of his inner life is subject to constant minor annoyances from the body. He sits down, he relaxes, he gets into the perfect mood, and something itches. <laughs> then he quietly gets past this point for a little while, and all of a sudden he remembers something. He remembers something that he should have taken care of and did not, or he remembers the phone call he ought to have made, or he remembers a promise that was broken. One thing or another comes in to interfere with this quiet meditative process. Then as meditation with the average person to start with is very apt to end in sleep. He thinks he is disciplining himself beautifully, and the next thing you know he's sound asleep. <laughs> And uh, I know one case in which a yoga here, a yogi here in Los Angeles, publicly speaking, in a large auditorium, seated himself on a table in the middle of the stage, ended meditation, and went fast asleep and fell off the table. <laughs> Normally speaking, this might have interfered with his reputation, but it did not. It really enhanced it. It was decided that he was in such deep meditation that he uh, actually almost ascended from the table. <laughs> but he ascended downward instead of upward. So sleep comes along. Fatigue, hunger, worry, interruptions of one kind or another, a little street noise. All kinds of things interfere. Many of these interferences are the result of the acuteness of the sensory perceptions, which have been trained to respond to certain stimuli. Others come merely from lack of 
correct exercising or posturing. The individual will find that meditative postures begin by being rather painful. The, the body aches when muscles are used differently. But altogether, the main problem with the meditation is that the body, the personality, the environment, the neighborhood, the actual house in which we physically live, all these interfere with quietude. They make it almost impossible for the individual to remain at peace. Now, the body has this type of problem also, somewhat due probably to dietetic and nutritional intake. A large part of the food that we take discomforts the body. It tries to let us know, but we simply take some kind of a digestive pill and keep right on going. We overeat, we undereat, we do all kinds of things that affect the body's peace of mind. And the body seems to have a little mind of its own. And as a result of that, when we call upon the body to make a little more constructive effort than usual, we very often find it unable to do so or unwilling to do so. So when we start trying to be better people, we have to begin with basics. And one of the basic factors we all have to face is the body. Now, there is a two-way relationship involved here. There is not the rela only the relation of the person to his body, but the relation of the body to the person himself. Sometimes one interferes with the other. Sometimes both interfere with each other. But to begin with, the most uh, probably elementary and basic situation is to try to get the body into partnership with the purposes of the individual. He, the person must decide what his problems are, what his objectives are, what he wants to accomplish. And having decided these things, he must bring his body into the partnership. One of the problems of the body is subject to is the reaction of outside circumstances upon the nervous system the digestive system, upon the sensory perceptions and the mental reflective organisms. All of these things mean that the body has to take a certain amount of abuse, and uh, this has to be controlled as much as possible. good example of our problem, a simple example today, is the fact that the average individual ab spends two to four hours a day viewing television. Now, television has a great many facets to it, but the problems that are most annoying in television, probably, uh, are those which disturb and dramatize the emotions and reflexes and cause the individual to have powerful nerve reactions. Uh, probably the most impressive of this group would be the horror and mystery story. The individual is constantly confronted with intentional efforts to stimulate the emotions. The uh, sponsors like to see the emotions stimulated. The producer wants to see this. And most of the audience has become so accustomed to it that if the picture does not have these factors, uh, they will turn it off. But these uh, types of films and productions injure the psychic integration of the nervous system. They make it more difficult for the person to use energy constructively. He has to waste energy defending himself against illusions and fantasies. By the time he gets through with some of these delightful spectacles, he's worn out, tired out, fatigued, simply by the expenditure of energy. The energy used for any purpose must be conserved. Physical energy is a, a kind of basic um, utility, uh, a basic form of life which is not uh, available to everyone equally. Physical energy is something that must be conserved, used, and directed. The waste of it is the waste of life itself. And those who waste it continuously 
will find life is shortened, health is impaired, and the progress of the individual towards his higher objectives will be definitely damaged. So we have to try to, to fight through this peculiar structure of body. Well, I've noticed over a long period of time, and I guess many of you have, have had the same experience, that people trying to be good very often succeed in being obnoxious. Uh, their virtues are not real. They attempt to frustrate something or to dominate someone else. And instead of learning to have a peaceful inner life, they become very sensitive and are annoyed by almost everything that happens. I know many cases in which the individual is suffering from morning to night from what he calls righteous indignation. The world becomes obnoxious to the person who is trying desperately to leave it. And as a result of that, his very process of staying here is made more obnoxious by his own reactions. The person who wants to really outgrow the body or transcend it must accomplish internal pleasantry. There must be a kindly, rather good-natured, relaxed attitude which permits the stomach to digest the food, permits the elimination to work properly, and also assists the biochemistry of the nutritional process in the human body. Everything that makes the individual angry, disgusted, mad, unhappy, unpleasant, revengeful, all of this type of emotion damages the chemistry of the human system. It makes it impossible for the person to digest the food properly. It results in all kinds of aches and pains, and a great many chronic ailments are nothing but chronic disposition that has set in to the degree that it has damaged the body. So with all the effort to be better people, to grow, to think, to be more enlightened, we must be sure to include the body in the plan. The body is something that is part of any plan we make, and we must never fail to give it that which is its proper due. To spoil the body is a mistake. To tyrannize it is equally dangerous. We must never allow it to rule us, but we must make our own discipline of it a very parental and not despotic. One way in which we uh, try to conquer bodily problems is through the study of them. Anyone who has certain bodily problems will have some idea of these problems and perhaps a fair idea of why he has them. Most people who are li li not living well know why, but they prefer to ignore it. They wish to forget it and go on doing the things that please them. But to begin a plan, if you're going to hope to become a scholar, to become a mystic, to become a servant of public good, if you want to do something better than you've done in art or music or literature, you've, you must take a very serious look at the body. Your purpose is not to rise above it in the sense of going against it, but rather rise above it in the sense of challenging it to be more of itself, to be better than it is, and not put in a position where it must fight back for survival. If you start with this, then, you find that the Greeks were very much given to this thought, and so were most ancient peoples. Uh, the, many of the philosophical schools of the Greeks were called gymnasium. And in uh, Europe today, the middle schools are often referred to as the gymnasiums. The gymnasium, in this case, from which we have merely a health uh, procedure, included in old times and in Europe in many parts till today, the entire educational procedure. It's all exercise. It's all discipline, control, and direction of energy resources. The individual who jogs is in a gymnasium. So is the person studying Latin. Uh, whatever use is made of energy, 
whatever organization is set up to enable the individual to achieve some definite purpose. This whole structure together is a gymnasium. It is a place where the mind, the emotions, and the body are trained together and become a part of a partnership and are not neglected, ignored, or variously outraged in the definite ambition to get somewhere. Particularly here in the West at the present time, where most of the success is measured in terms of money, uh, we are annoyed by the fact that medical care is becoming more expensive. One of the reasons why it is becoming more expensive is because we are becoming more dependent upon it. And wherever you are de create a dependency, you subject yourself to exploitation of some kind. If the average person took ca fair care of themselves, uh, there would not be this tremendous demand for medical assistance, and doctors would be satisfied to work more reasonably. But because they have created a massive profit system out of the human being's abuse of himself, and neglect of others, he is in a position to charge anything he wants. But in the final analysis, the person trying to grow must start in by educating the various elements of his own nature. The Greeks, of course, held a great deal for calisthenics. They regarded a proper exercise as something that should be cultivated from the cradle. Now, exercise of a normal kind, as Socrates pointed out, must not be a technical boredom. Socrates said he was never able to exercise merely for the sake of exercising. He couldn't imagine anyone becoming interested in jogging around the block. The only reason that anyone does it is a desperate effort to be healthy. Now, the Greeks developed methods of exercise uh, which were not so stayed and uh, uh, unpleasant or unfulfilling. They lived in a world in which this tremendous involvement in industry and economics did not exist. They did not have to spend eight or nine hours a day at a desk. They did not have to do all the foolish and stupid things that we consider to be essential. Also, of course, they had no knowledge whatever of denatured foods. They ate the food that grew near to them, and it was never processed. They just lived naturally. It would be quite inconceivable to imagine a cat or a dog going out each morning and chinning the bar to keep its figure. It gets all the exercise it needs being itself. But where the individual as a human being has ceased to be himself, and gives little or no attention to this phase of his personality, he has to manufacture all kinds of artificial ways of trying to do what he should do naturally. So it is very important to start in with a basic realization of values. Another very basic realization that the Greeks had, which we do not have, and that is that you do not build a reputation for excellence by wearing an expensive toga. You are not any better than you are, and there's no amount of decoration on the outside that will actually change the, the nature and substance of yourself. So the Greeks did not try to hide the imperfections of their bodies. They rather try to live so that these imperfections would not develop. And where there were imperfections, they allowed them to be there. It is reported that Socrates was pigeon-chested. He may have been. But at the same time, he faced it, and his friends knew it. There was no effort to conceal it. He did not go into cosmetic surgery to take care of his pigeon-chest. He accepted it, but he lived above it. And he lived so well that even with it, when he was called into the army as a soldier to defend the Greeks, when the enemy saw him standing in the field armed and ready, they divided and went on each side of him. They had no intentions of facing him. So he came back a hero. 
but uh, he also uh, had trouble staying awake on sentry duty. So he said this now becomes a discipline. So he practiced being a sentry standing on only one foot. And he became so proficient at it that he could do eight hours of sentry duty on one foot without even changing the feet. This was discipline. It was making something obey him. Generally speaking, most of the uh, older peoples of the world live more naturally than we do. Ambitions were much less aggressive, and persons in various strata of society expected to remain there. But because of the lack of false values, the lack of artificial activities, these people seem to have done fairly well, and they had time enough to produce some exalted thinkers. Uh, during the age of Pericles, uh, probably in Greece alone, we had produced four to between four and six hundred very great intellects. During the age of Pericles, uh, probably a half of the thinking of the world was done because these people, living naturally, having no false exaggerations to concern them, were able to settle down to use faculties instead of trying to repair abused ones. This is something we can't do entirely, but we should try to work on it a little. We should try to make sure that we are getting a maximum of constructive result from the efforts that we make to live that what we are doing will always help, never hurt, the major pro uh, projects of life. Of course, when someone asked, I think it was Aristippus, or one of the old Greeks, uh, the greatest curse uh, that would be imaginable, he said the greatest curse would be for a man to tell his son, live extravagantly. L luxury was the great curse. It still is. And it is because of luxury that most of the world's thinking is very badly done at the present time. We are not saving the energies. The body has them. It is born with them. With a little care we can take care of them. But we cannot repair active wasting of energy on matters of no value. So we have to try to work with the body, realizing its potential, representing the facts of life to the body and living accordingly ourselves. These procedures are of the greatest uh, felicity to all concerned. Now the body as we study it is a tremendously fascinating thing. It, it is a, a structure, it is a house that can restore itself. It is, it is made up of brick and mortar and steel, all of it alive. And then it being a compound of constantly living elements, it is exceedingly responsive and reactive to the processes which take place within it. Now over this body, as seated in authority, is something that uh, in the thousands and millions of years of human evolution uh, should be pretty smart, but it isn't always that way. The human being today is equipped, if he wants to use the equipment, for a vast amount of self-improvement. He is capable of being more than he could ever have been before. And if we recognize evolution as a growing process and realize that we are progressing all the time, then at any given moment we should have available to us a wealth of previous experience. This may not be available in actual conscious thought but it is available to us in instinct, in intuition, conscience, and many of those factors which tell us something of our own previous experiences with right and wrong. But the body being uh, in the control of this the other thing, this self, this mind, not only must obey, the body can't refuse to obey except uh, at the cost of survival. But the human being can change its attitude toward the body at any time it wishes to. Buddha makes a very great and definite point out of this entire situation. 
to Buddha, the great enemy of mankind, was the person living in a house but abusing it. The poor housekeeper, the housekeeper that allows the house to run down, is the offender. The house cannot help running down if no one takes care of it. The body might be able to continue to take care of itself if the mind did not decree that the body make mistakes, demand these mistakes, require the body to accept as natural things that no physical organism can support very long. So the, uh, the Buddha points out very definitely that the tyrant is the mind. It is the mind that does it. It is the mind that is the slayer of the real, as, in the, as we find in the Bhagavad Gita. The mind is the slayer of the body, if we are not careful. Just as minds get together and create armies and kill each other, so the mind in man becomes a militant despot and destroys the very body that it depends upon. And in the course of this destruction probably ruins its relationship with all outside factors of civilization and environment. So we have to start at the bottom and build. One thing the person should do, begin with, is regulate life. Regulating life means to set up patterns that the person can perpetuate without constant breaking of these patterns. Food should be taken regularly, and it should be of a nature and quality that is suitable to the needs. The snack bar and all the odds and ends damage the body. The body should also rest at various times during the day. And persons beyond the age of 50 will find it very important to rest for a short time every day just to give the body a chance to reorganize its resources. I've told that to many people and they usually say resting is a waste of time. It is not. The person who is tired and will not rest is the one who is wasting both time and life. Having set upon oneself the disciplines of things, we can be a little like the Zen monk who in the uh, shram, after he has finished his dinner, takes the plate that he ate from and puts it in water and washes it and then drinks the dish water. That neats things up very much. But we have the, a lesson there which is purely Zen. Whatever we clean up, we have to drink the dishwater. It is part of the process of life. And some of the people have been very wise and thoughtful in their interpretation of these ancient fables. Having organized our resources in these details, we should go a little further to find out more about why we have the attitudes we do. Today, particularly, we are all becoming uh, dominated by attitudes. And most attitudes that we're holding today are destructive. The attitude person is the one who has made up their mind before the evidence is even considered, and who finds everything to, to be what he expects it to be, because he rejects any other interpretation. Attitudes that are combative, attitudes that are self-centered, attitudes that are revengeful or uh, despondent, morose, self-pitying, all these attitudes are very bad for the body. The body taking them on begins to lose certain functional processes. If you hold a mental dyspepsia long enough, it will become a physical dyspepsia, because the various processes of assimilation within the system are all symbolically set forth in the physical processes of digestion. So if we go along quietly, we start to be better people by coming to terms with the body and recognizing it for what it is, a wonderful and useful friend, something we can depend on to give us terrific service if we will take care of it. 
But like an automobile that is neglected, it will not uh, survive. Having made this basic arrangement, then we can more or less ask and receive the loyalty of the body. It is very difficult for a bad master to have loyal servants. A poor housekeeper will never win the, lo the loyalty of employees or persons who come in to do various things. You must, you must respect, you must demonstrate an ability, an integrity, and a fairness in all procedures, procedures in order to demand or receive a loyalty. The body will be loyal to the mind if the mind is thoughtful of the body. It is a two-way procedure. The body will react by greater efficiency, comfort, ease, and a surprising amount of reserve energy. But if the loyalty is missing, if the person has no interest in protecting the body, he's going to get in trouble because he's going to do all kinds of things without any consideration for the effect of these things upon the human constitution. Wherever we depress uh, our relationships with the body, we expose ourselves to epidemic ailments and to all kinds of definite infirmities. As we get along in life, we also have to make certain compromises with the body. The body begins to tell us it is a little more tired than it used to be. It hasn't got quite as much energy as it once had. And though it is pretty effective and still quite good, you'll have to give a little more attention to it. It's just like working with a run-down old house. We may have kept it up very well, but as it gets older, it needs special attention, and you can't prevent a deterioration if that attention is not bestowed. So the body begins to need certain conservation processes. The very great mistake that has been made by a number of persons is to try to live young, as far as the physical body is concerned, beyond the age when this is reasonable and probable or possible. The body cannot, by willpower alone, compensate for age. Some people are much more active in older years than others. But wherever the person reaches a maturity and older years, he must go into a strong, friendly relationship with the body. He must make that body work as well as it can and as long as possible. And if the person continues to be willful, and do only what he wants to do and ignores the body, he will be in trouble. Of course, he may lean back upon medical help or feel that if he dissipates mildly, he can get over it. But every amount of this loss of energy and loss of purpose has its very heavy price that we have to pay for it. The Greek men, the each Egyptian and Roman mysteries, were, I suppose, the most uh, perfect forms of education that we have ever known. They were the only system that educated the total person. That They educated not only the mind, but the body. They educated the emotions, the hopes, the ideals. They educated the individual socially to his responsibilities to those around him. Education made the person as nearly complete as his own basic character could permit. And where it was incomplete, there was a recognition of this and a corresponding humility. The individual did not try to bluff his way through his own imperfections. The Greeks, therefore, followed the old methods of discipline. They required those who wished to become wise to prepare the body for wisdom. They not only had to prepare the mind by training it in mathematics, astronomy, and music, but they had to also have enough understanding and insight of the relation of the body to the person to make sure that nothing necessary was neglected. 
Various philosophers back in those days had different attitudes about what the body really was. Most, however, agreed definitely that the body was a divinely bestowed instrument, that it was given to us in order that we might work with nature, that the human body is man's link with the natural world. It is his link with the world of the farms and the forests. It also gave him the contact with other human beings, providing him with the sensory perceptions useful and necessary to the cultivation of the mental and spiritual life. So the body was man's link with externals, with environment, with the things around him. Actually, this was very important because if it had not been important, it is no doubt uh, obvious that we would not have received the body. The body is something we have because we need it, because we have to use it, and because there is a right and a wrong way of using it, and the right way is good and the wrong way is evil. These are very simple conclusions the ancients worked with. They gradually purified the life of the person. They gradually redeemed all eccentric or irrational procedure. It was determined very definitely that no matter how great an intellectual you might be, if you are selfish, you can never be wise until you first of all overcome the selfishness. Between the individual and the divine light which he seeks, we'll find all of the qualifying mistakes which he continues to maintain, practice, and very often nurse uh, with great ardor and affection. The uh, person who has false ideas blocks the true ones. According again to these same people, three great books have been given to us. One, of course, is scripture, the great sacred writings of the world. One is nature by means of which we can study all of the operations of the divine will. And the third is man himself, through the understanding and interpretation of which he gains the skill and courage to develop his own internal resources. The uh, key to man's correction of his own faults lies in his uh, operations in nature. He becomes more and more aware of the way the world works, and gradually he comes to realize that he is part of that world and that his body is subject to the laws of the earth, and that he must obey them. But the earth itself is subject to the rules and laws of heaven. But there is no conflict between heaven and earth. The conflict is between man and his own ambitions. And when we realize this, we can begin to build a closer relationship. Another point that is interesting, I think, is to realize that the body is the carrier of a certain type of memory. Within the body is a record of previous bodies, what they did, how they functioned, and how they were disciplined and trained. A, a good example of discipline with a body is music. A, a musician, especially a vocalist or an instrumentalist for that matter, must control the body. The musician must practice regularly, must dedicate his life to maintaining the peak uh, of his own capacity and ability. He must never neglect, never overlook, never to be too busy to protect the talent which he has gradually developed. He must become, in a sense, a slave of a talent. Now, we don't all want to, to take on this degree of servitude, but we must all of us become servants of any talent or ability which we seek to perfect. We have to be able to exercise our control over disposition which is, of course, partly physical and partly the reaction of the mind upon the physical and then the physical reacting back again upon the mind. This type of interrelationship we find every day. 
So if we want really to, to get the accomplishments we need, we have to realize that the Zen man is right in one thing. The light of heaven shines upon the peaceful person. Peace within the self is the secret of man's conscious relationship with space. Space in a mysterious way is silent. Nearly all of the great voices that speak to man are not audible. They are voices that speak in thoughts, in dreams, in hopes, aspirations, and in the strange experiences of mysticism. But everything that happens is a definite challenge. We have to learn to accept in silence that which is necessary for us to know. Silence for the body is harmony. Silence for the body is the fact that there is nothing indigestible going into the system. Silence for the body is good elimination. Uh, silence for the body is proper relaxation and rest. It is free from all poison and toxins which destroy the body because a poisoned coma is not the silence of the wise. So once we have the body quieted down, so it is not constantly demanding something, or expecting something, or suspicious that we are demanding something, then we can, we can be quiet. We can sit with a good book and enjoy it. We can walk back for a little while in nature and be refreshed. We can look at a great work of art and our spirits are inspired and comforted. Silence inside of ourselves means free from forced meaning, from interruption, or from conflict, from prejudice relating to these kind of things. Having gained a physical silence, and having learned to love a certain silence, we can then decide what we want to put into it. Having cleaned the inside of the cup, of everything that is not important, we can then take this silence and refurnish it. It would be like getting rid of a lot of old broken down furniture in a house. If we want to get rid of the furniture that we do not want or do not need, then we can settle down and refurnish. Once we have cleared the mind of trash and trivia, we can then settle down to refurnishing our mental home. We can decide what we need, what is going to be truly comfortable, and we can allow to come into that silence that which enriches it, but do not allow to come in that which disturbs it. After we uh, begin this process, we also discover something else. We are nearly always disturbed by things that we refuse or reject. We are disturbed by uh, conditions which we have not digested which we have not analyzed, which we have not controlled. Therefore, if we achieve silence within ourselves truly, we will find that the interruptions become progressively fewer. And what disturbed us desperately last week will not bother us at all if our own inner silence is stronger. Now, silence is not to neglect. Silence is not a vacuum. It is a peace. It is quietude. It is the strongest situation possible, whereas simply turning off the mind can be a very negative and useless thing. We cannot block out thought, but we can re en ennoble it by ennobling the function that gives it to us. So then we begin to bring back into our silence the things that make us happy. We begin to listen to great music. We learn to appreciate great artistry. And we also learn all kinds of little things inside of ourselves that we can do. We can develop talents that we sense but have not yet evolved. Out of the silence, we build a new life based upon peace, upon inner contentment, and upon a constant process of enrichment, the enriching of values. And little by little, we put a nice new set of furnishings in the house. But these furnishings are proper. 
They are not gathered by, for ulterior motives. We're not refurnishing the house because we want to keep up with the Joneses. We are not furnishing it because we want more expensive things than our neighbors. We are not even furnishing it because we have no longer any interest in old things. In the peaceful heart there is neither old nor new, but there is a gradual increase of the sense of value, that which is most proper, that which is most complete to the inner life, that is the thing we shall try to acquire if possible. So we can develop a few little hobbies that help. We can enjoy uh, good books and good friends. We can also gradually find the need for variety in our inner life. We find that if we pray all the time we will not become virtuous, we will become sick. We also realize that if we go out trying to help people when we don't know what we are doing ourselves, that a certain frustration is going to result. We all have to work out these problems of making our silence the basis of a new career. And if it is built upon this quietude within ourselves, it has no enemies. It has lost uh, the power to have enemies and do that type of thing. There's a story about Diogenes, who liked to live in a tub in the Athenian Forum, and used to speak to his associate while standing near a wall that led up to another level. One day, a soldier listening to him disagreed with him, so leaned over the wall and spat at him. The Socrates, Diogenes looked up and and then he turned to his friend and he said, You know, I think I should be angry at that man. But I've forgotten how. <laughs> now it's going to be a long time before most of us nowadays are going to forget how to be angry. Or how to be revengeful. Or how to get, work a nice and gentle insult at the proper moment. But there comes this inner peace that says this is no good. We are wasting energy that we can't afford to lose. Now we have energy in short, short supply all over the world. Our energy resources are being depleted. About the only energy resources that are as yet available to most of us are our own energy. The energy to use the life in ourselves for the greatest good to all concerned. So to do this, we can't waste any of it. We can't waste any time in trivia. We can't waste much time in small talk or in useless activities. We can't spend too much time uh, working along with social situations that have no future and very little past. It becomes a matter of building a rich life by varying it, but always by doing things that are basically important and significant. And after we get a fair degree of uh, control over our own attitudes, so that we can really sit down and ask ourselves a very pertinent question, for instance, for people in our field of thought. Why do I want to be spiritual? Why do I want to be enlightened? And there'll be all kinds of answers, some of which you'll block before you even shape them, because you will realize they are not the best. But the question is always why do we want to be better than we are? One answer to that, of course, is it is our destiny. We were created to become better every day. We were created to outgrow our own past constantly. Another thing that uh, we can say is that the more we learn, the more we know, the more we understand, the more useful we can be. The more we can really be helpful. Because there is very little true helpfulness in passing along our own personal undigested opinions. Most people are suffering from that type of opinionism which Epictetus calls a falling sickness of the reason. And why give advice to another which has never worked for ourselves? So we, do, we want to know more. We want to be better. 
We want this dynamo, this battery that we've got between the rib cages. We want this to support a project. We want this life energy to be used, not wasted or abused or thrown away. We don't wish to pass out of life at the end of the present embodiment full of energy we've done nothing with. We want to use it. And we want to use it primarily for the common good. One of the most dangerous thoughts that we can have is that we want to get better in order that we may be better than somebody else. That is a very sad mistake. The idea of growing so that we can become sort of spiritual aristocrats is a complete loss, and the stomach won't stand for it either. Every part of us will rebel against a false motive. Therefore, false motives will kill you just as quick as bacteria and uh, germs. We have to grow because it is our duty. We have to be better because it is our divine right. And we have to accomplish everything possible for the unfoldment of ourselves in order that we can be of the greatest service to all. The individual who gains without desiring to serve is wasting time. Now, it's an interesting thing to contemplate sometimes the two persons performing exactly the same action. In one, it may be a commitment to good, and in another, it may be no commitment to anything. It is not the action. It is the motive. It is the reason within yourself why you do a certain thing that determines whether that action is good or bad. Therefore, it is very important for the individual to have motives above reproach, and that the good deed can really be good all the way down to the core, and not simply a gesture on the surface with no substance in reality behind it. If we, therefore, are generous to other people, why? Are we trying to buy them? Do we expect that if we are generous to them, they will be generous to us? Or are we generous because we want to show off that we are rich enough to be generous? Is it a gesture of aristocracy? If we are generous, is it because we are informed by our religion that generosity is a virtue that must be practiced? All of these are the false motives, really. Even the idea of a religious generosity uh, is not right, unless there is something very deep in the religious part of ourselves behind it. The reason for generosity is someone needs, and we have the privilege of sharing. Generosity is, is something that comes from the heart, without expectation of reward, without any uh, prominent action. Secret giving was the secret of the old way of doing it. No one wanted applause, no one wanted recognition. In fact, St. Nicholas, who is the hero of this season, was the original saint of secret giving. He used to, uh, according to the stories, he used to drive by on a donkey at night and toss coins in windows so that in the morning the people whom he knew to need them, the money, would find it, but he would never let them know who gave it. He, he even went so far as to sell or mortgage or, or pawn the vessels on the altar of his church in order to feed the needy. That's the best use, probably, that was ever made of those utensils. There's one story, kind of cute, probably apocryphal, that one night when he was threw some coins in the window, one of the coins fell in a child's stocking. And from that time on, we had the habit of placing the stocking up for Christmas. But St. Nicholas represented the secret giver, the charity that came directly from the heart without any thought of reward. Probably... Uh, a friend of mine who always liked certain things and uh, never really knew why he liked them, he once told me when I asked him why something pleased him, he said, it pleases me. That's why I do it. I do it because it pleases me. Well, 
What he did was very generous and very thoughtful, and it indicated that the right kind of things were the things that pleased him. So it is simply because we have a feeling about things that we want to do something about them. But the idea of ulterior motives sneaking in is wrong, because this ulterior motive somehow inside of our own conscience we estimate it. This, mo this uh, motivation, this ulterior motivation, finally is interpreted in terms of blood, blood cells, allergies, and all kinds of things of this kind. And the ulterior motive goes right into the physical body to give it more trouble. We have to be honest to the body if we expect the body to protect us through the long years of life. So honesty is the proper relationship. Now as we go along a little further with this type of thing, we say, what comes next? Well, the individual wishes to study some line of thought, some belief, some teaching that is going to help them to uh, have a better life. This is perfectly commendable. But now comes the problem of censoring the teaching. There are all kinds of things you can believe in this world, but so many of these beliefs are just a little dubious. And when you start studying, you have to think a little bit to find out why the person from whom you are getting the lessons uh, is doing what they are doing. Is the person that is teaching you unselfish? Are they there merely to help you? Or are they really there either to enrich themselves or gratify their own ambitions? Most people who are a little frustrated in other matters find a religious allegiance a means of self-gratification. It is their one possible way of becoming conspicuous in something. And this is the wrong motive. And this wrong motive comes out along with many others in the health problems. And uh, we know that the various biochemical remedies and so forth all have moral overtones. We will sometimes be able to computerize our emotions we're going to realize that there's a great chemistry there, a chemistry which we've never investigated, but that there is a reason behind every emotion that we have and every thought that we have. And unless that reason is founded in peace, in the quietude of an inner life that has no ulterior motives, unless it is founded in that, the future of the student is in danger. There's one thing, of course, that has saved a great many people, and we can't afford to overlook it. Some of the best people I know have become better by following teachings that were not good. Now, it's hard to understand how this can happen, but it's one thing is true, beyond doubt, that if the person is basically sincere, you cannot destroy a completely sincere person. They will take no, a message, no matter how poor it may be, and transmute it by their own sincerity. They will find better meanings for things, and these meanings are better than the original meanings that were in the lesson. The sincere person is protected against corruption by the fact that they are inwardly honest. And as W.C. Fields is reported to have said on another occasion, you can't cheat an honest man. The reason why you can cheat people is because there's a little larceny in them already. They are looking for something for nothing. They are bargain seeking. They are trying to escape some uh, infirmity or the restriction without overcoming or changing themselves. They are not doing it the right way. So when, once you finally get to the point where you want outside help, then it is very necessary for you to have this quietude within yourself. The quietude that protects the body, protects the mind, the heart, and opens the way to the soul in a wonderful and clear manner. As you go further along, of course, it gets a little more complicated. If a very uh, immature person makes certain mistakes, uh, motive being uncertain, 
abilities being inconclusive. Uh, apparently, uh, the Lord is rather patient with them. It is the person who finally, having known better, uh, makes a bad break, who goes against his own convictions for some ulterior motive. That one is in trouble. Therefore, it is true that the more advanced we become in the search for truth, the more we become the servants of that truth. And anything in which we appear to disobey that truth must cause us pause and consideration immediately. The higher we go in our insights, the more desperate our condition becomes if we betray the truth that we claim to love. So everything depends on these right motives. Now if the right motives come along, and the person follows them reasonably well and does what is approximately proper, I think that he will find that he will have a good allotment of years. All this peace in his soul is going to result, result in normal functions. The person's body will not be bothered or eclipsed by pressures or tensions. Food that might even be a little difficult can be digested if the mind is at rest and the body can give the full tendency uh, of digestion to the process. But if at the time we eat something that is indigestible, we also have a feud with someone, or we try to get out of it by a definite medication that itself is dangerous, then we are compounding the felony. If we are uh, right on all these things, and we behave ourselves very well, there's no reason why our lives should not be a fully experienced period. Karma that we have brought forward has to be met, but in spite of that, we will have a good life, and we will also be planning for a still better one. We will have much better health, and we will find that by inward light, inward peace, inward quiet, we can actually overcome a number of dangerous external situations. We are worried about smog. We are worried about water pollution. We are worried about all these things. But if the person inside himself is actually at quietude and peace and dedicated to the earnest carrying on of useful labors, it would be amazing how much uh, pollution we can stand and survive it. Whereas if we are constantly aware of nothing but the pollution and make no effort to transcend the weaknesses in ourselves, the pollution is much more difficult to work with. The right attitudes in these things must be cultivated, and they all come from quietude. The moment noise gets in, trouble starts. And noise inside of ourselves is the most difficult of all to silence. So we go along and we use the body as a kind of barometer. The body tells us, in a sense, the direct and immediate consequences of what we think, what we feel, and what we do. The body tells us when we are extravagant and waste, because then there is privation. The body tells us when we don't rest properly or that we are too much involved in some preoccupation. The body warns us of all kinds of improprieties of conduct, of nutrition, and exercise. The body is there to help us to keep the rules. And the uh, body is so obvious to us that it's much easier, in a sense, to work with that level of pattern than it is with the mental and emotional levels themselves. There is also something so final about the body in these things. We always think we can bribe the emotions so that we can bluff the mental attitudes. But when we get a stomach ulcer, we know we've got it. And we know it's going to stay there until we do something about it. And if we neglect it long enough, it will destroy us. So we are in the presence of law operating, not maliciously, not viciously, but inevitably. In the body, we can see the consequences of all types of indiscretion coming home to roost. We can see them moving in on us, 
and we can realize that four or five years of bad habits will make a very serious inroad into our future usefulness. And as most people are looking more or less toward some type of uh, utopia, they want to look forward to retiring to that little place in the country. Uh, they want to do the things they've always felt they would like to do. And they want to have a fair reward for what they did when they work and labor. So we can put it this way if we want to. We can say, why did they work and how did they work? Did they work because, primarily, they knew they needed work? Or did they simply work in order to get later uh, a pension and be able to do these things they wanted to do? Now, if they worked, work was sincere and they got a good day's work and they earned their wages properly, then the chances are the body, the mind, and the emotions will be supporting. But the individual who had never really cared for his job took all he could got, get and give as little for it. When his time comes to retire and go on vacation, he very often can't do it. His health is so bad he can't do anything. Or he is so disillusioned and tired and fatigued he doesn't want to anymore. So the motive behind the job also has something to do with the overtones of reward you get later. The uh, motives behind the job of irritation and constant dissatisfaction affected the body, unfortunately. And out of this, in turn, uh, came a limitation of the retirement period. There are many people who retire, and they are so tired, wearied, worn out, and disillusioned that they don't want to do anything. No human being in this world has to be disillusioned. They disillusion themselves. They are disillusioned when they expect the impossible. They are disillusioned when they don't get what they have not earned. They are disillusioned by the world around them. But the answer to it all lies in an attitude within themselves. Now, sometimes this attitude is due to the kidneys or the liver of cutting up. But more apt in the most cases, the attitude comes first. And after you hold it long enough, the liver and the kidneys will react and you will have permanent disabilities. So the person has to have peace within himself or live with disabilities. If he has to live with disabilities, he must live with them as graciously as possible, always realizing that every act that he performs, every decision that he makes, is part of the great plan of growth. And out of all these little efforts and the bigger efforts and the mistakes and the things done well, the human being is evolving toward the divine fullness of himself which is the goal of all, all existence. Deity as the great educator, the great enlightener, the great perfecter of all things, has set up the plan that cannot fail, because in time, regardless of our mistakes, we are going to learn to do it right. The only difficulty is that we wait so long in some cases. Why shouldn't we start in by doing it right? Well, perhaps in the beginning we don't have the motives. By the time we get the motives, we don't have the energy. But the time to start is now, to do it the best you can, and to make sure that you keep a very happy relationship, because the body shows whether you are able to control yourself. The body shows you the discipline, which is necessary to the happiness in other areas of your life. So working in team with the body as a partnership you have a situation that cannot fail. But if one fails the other, the failure is spread over the entire environment sometimes. So work together with the body in a close partnership, and you will find improved health, greater happiness, and peace of mind. Well, thank you very much, folks. I guess that's all for today.